investing in yourself. This is one thing that you could see it as. I'm taking time off for me. I'm taking time off to learn how to grow, right? So we don't continue making the same mistakes, having the same failures, having the same guilt trips. So I applaud you for being here on time. And uh, besides our lesson, we're also going to have an amazing activity uh, hosted, I mean, taught by Megan and Raquel, her assistant. <laughs> and uh, how many of you have poured before? None of us. Okay, good. So we're all going to do it together. <laughs> I've poured my life, but not in painting. <laughs> I poured many tears, yeah. right, <laughs> but not painting. So now we're going to get that experience of pouring tears and to pouring something beautiful. Amen. Um, so welcome, broadcast viewers. Uh, we welcome you for joining us online. Um, so let's go ahead and rise up. But before you do, this is the end of the year. And actually, it's been two years that we've had this women's group. And it's been such an amazing uh, journey. It's been such a great teachings, and uh, if any of you have missed any of the teachings, I want to encourage you to go to YouTube, uh, do the search, Rise Up Outreach, Woman of Valor, and we've had so many teachings about uh, the battlefield of the mind, uh, the uh, full armor of God, your identity in Christ, so many great teachings uh, through the past two years that it has helped us, helped us grow, amen. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, we want to be timeful today. So let's rise up and let's start in prayer, okay, and, uh, and then I'm going to hand it off to our first teacher for the day, which is my friend and my, my sister, and she's my twin, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> Everybody, says that, but Everybody. Really over 20 people have told us, are you guys sisters? Are you guys twins? I'm like, listen, she's a Guana from Cuba. I'm an Indian from South America. I don't see how are we twins, but yeah, maybe we're spiritual twins. Okay. <laughs> we sure are. And you, you, know, you, you, you turn out to be who you hang out the most with. That's right. So association is very important. That's why I always like to hang out with younger people, so I look younger. <laughs> That's why she hangs out with me. <laughs> no, that's why she hangs out with me. <laughs> so anyways, Father God, we come before your righteous throne. Thanking you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you have made today. And we choose today to rejoice. We choose today to give you our hearts, give you our minds, Lord, so we could hear from you, Lord, so we could learn, Lord, how to have more of your character, how to be a fruitful tree, Father God, because this life is there to challenge us, uh, and th there's a battle going on all the time, and if we're not anchored, if we're not right-rooted in you, Lord, it's very easy to get persuaded, it's very easy to get overrun, it's very easy to get uh, exhausted in life, Lord, but we choose you. We, we want more of you, Father God. I pray that you teach us and you guide us today. You mold us today. You, you speak to us our heart individually, Lord. What we need to hear from you today, Lord, we um, empty ourselves out and so you could increase in us, Lord. Holy Spirit, have your way, Lord. Holy Spirit, let this be something that brings you honor, Father God, something that you manifest yourself, Lord. We want to not only feel your presence, but we want to feel the manifestation of your presence, Holy God. So, Lord, we thank you for this, ladies, today. We thank you for all the broadcast viewers. I pray that you prepare our hearts and our minds to hear from you today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Amen and amen. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning, broadcast viewers. And this is going to be a two-part series in one day. So I, can, I'm, I have 30 minutes, and then Sandra's going to have the second half so that we can go on ahead and enjoy the snacks that we have for you and the special art that we're going to be doing, the pouring, which I'm really excited about. So the fruit of the Spirit is what we're going to learn today. How the Spirit works in and through us as believers. And I want to go back a little bit, and I want to talk to you about what our body is actually uh, composed of in three parts, in the spiritual and the, in the natural. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. 
So we know from this scripture that we are three parts. We are spirit, soul, and body. Those are the three parts that we are as human beings, as God created us uh, and uh, when he created Adam, man. So when we were created, we, our, our soul is our life, that is our humanity, who we are. It's our mind, our will, and our emotions. That is what our soul is. The body is the outside, the outer part, what we call the carnal flesh. That's why I say submit your flesh, because the flesh is always, always warring. The, the flesh and the soul are always warring against the spirit. Now, the, the spirit, if you are not a believer, it says that your spirit is dead. But when you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and it activates the, Holy, the Spirit in you. And that's why we're, as believers, we're always warring between our flesh and our soul against the Spirit, because the Spirit always wants to do what is perfect, and our flesh always wants to give in to the things of the flesh. So in Acts 1.8, it says, but when you will receive power, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Before Christ died and rose again, everybody was spiritually dead. But when the Holy Spirit came, the, Lord, the, uh, the word here says that the Holy Spirit was given us to us to give us power. Because we need that power to be able to fight against the flesh and the spirit. The body is, like I said, it's carnal. The soul is your mind, will, and emotions. The spirit is eternal, and eventually the spirit of man will either go to hell or go to heaven. That is why if, you, if, it's, if it's going to hell, it's because you're spiritually dead. If it's going to heaven, it's because you're alive, because you have the Holy Spirit, because you are a believer, you've given your life to the Lord. That is what the word tells us. So, there are three pleasures that each one of these requires. The body seeks carnal pleasure. The spirit seeks happiness. Now, happiness is not what you think. It's temporal. Many people confuse that with joy, and we're going to explain that later. But happiness is temporal. You can be happy one moment, something happened, and then you're sad, or you're depressed, or, or you're gloomy. So the, the, the soul craves for happiness, but it, that is only temporal. The spirit, on the other hand, is the one that gives you joy. And the only one that can give you joy is God Almighty through the Holy Spirit. That is the only one that can give you joy because this joy is not something that comes and goes. Joy's, joy is in us and it's a decision. It's, it's something that, is, that overtakes us. And even if we're sad because something happened that your soul is sad, your spirit will be joyful and you will have that assurance that everything will be okay. So... Ephesians 2.5 says, even when we were spiritually dead, remember we talk about when you're not a believer, you are spiritually dead, and separated from him, because that's what separated us from him, uh, because of our sins, he made us spiritually alive together with Christ, for by his grace, his undeserved favor and mercy, you have been saved from God's judgment. So we as believers are saved from God's judgment. We can go boldly before the throne of God when we are believers. And we and ask for forgiveness. And the Lord, through his grace and his mercy, he forgives us. Okay, so starting in Galatians 5, before our main scripture is going to be in Galatians, 
the fruit of the Spirit. But I want to go a little bit more so you can understand this and see what's happening in order for those gifts, that, not that gifts, I'm sorry, for the fruit of the Spirit to be manifest in you. Gifts are different, so I want to clarify that. The gifts of the Spirit are different than the fruit of the Spirit. So today we're going to learn about the fruit of the Spirit. Okay. In Galatians 5... Starting in verse 16, it says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be going, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil. Remember I said your, your flesh, your soul, wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants to do. It's completely opposite. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. Remember I told you they were warring against each other? These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation to the law of Moses. In the law of Moses... We know that before the Holy Spirit came, we were spiritually dead. So now we're not under the law. We're under grace. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Okay, this is our sinful nature. Remember I told you that the soul and the body craves a pleasure. There's pleasure. This is what it craves. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality impurity, lustful pleasures, lustful pleasures, <laughs> idolatry, idolatry is anything you put above the Lord, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. This is just a few. There's many things that fall under that category. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And here is going to be our main Bible scripture to, for today. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So you see, even when we come to the Lord, we still have that sinful nature. We still have the lust. We still have the sexual desires because that, remember the the, the body and the soul seek that pleasure for happiness, for fulfillment. But the, the true fulfillment is in the spirit. So when we have the spirit, the spirit will guide us. So that's why it's so important that every day we spend time with the Lord, that we pray, that we worship him. There are times that even when you don't feel like worshiping him, even when you don't feel like praying, you have to press through. You have to push through because that is where you're going to get the spirit to over, overcome and overtake all those fleshful desires. Only prayer, spending time with the Lord, reading the word is going to get you through that. So I want to, uh, Mackenzie, would you mind being, I want to explain something because there's always been a confusion about this Bible verse. Let's go back to Galatians 22 where it says, but the Holy uh, Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Notice it only says fruit. It doesn't say fruits. Fruits are multiple things, but let me give you an example here. Everybody uses a tree, but I'm going to use a human body <laughs> as an example. I don't say, look at Mackenzie's bodies. I said, look at Mackenzie's body. It's one. But look how many different parts she has. 
She has her hand, which is different from her foot. She has her ear, which is different from her nose. She has her eyes, which are different from her elbows. They are all part of one body, but they function together. Now, if one of them is missing, you can still function, but it's not going to be 100% what the, what the Lord wants you to be. Thank you, Mackenzie. <laughs> so that's, so you have to keep that in mind. F the fruit here means that it's a composition of many different things. It is a composition of love, of peace, of joy, of gentleness, of self-control, of goodness, of kindness. All those things work together, and those things are the fruit of the Spirit. So you will not have the fruit of the Spirit until you give your life to the Lord. And like I said, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and, and, and gives you the power, the strength that you need to be able to fight against those other uh, fleshly desires that we talked about before. So let's move on into um, why do we need the Holy Spirit? Okay, so we need... The, I'm sorry, why do we need the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Because like we, we discussed, if you don't have the fruit of the Holy Spirit, there is no way that you're going to be able to battle against those other things that happen. What is the opposite of love? Hate. You would have hate. What is the opposite of peace? Uh, unrest. Sadness. What is the opposite of patience? Wanting to kill somebody, you know. <laughs> an outburst. So you need the Holy Spirit. You need the fruit of the Holy Spirit in you to be able to overcome those fleshly desires, which again, even if you're a Christian, you will still have them. So um, let's go and let's talk about love. That is the first uh, characteristic, the first uh, the, uh, characteristic of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Greek word here is agape. We know that there are many different definitions and manifestations of that word in, in, the, in, the, Holy Go in the gospel. The one that is shown here for the fruit of the Spirit is agape, which is the unconditional love that somebody has. In this case, the unconditional, God's love is unconditional for us. No matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, he has unconditional love for us, right? So agape is a choice rather than a feeling. It is a decision to sacrifice your own comfort, your own wants, your own desires, and meet the needs of another person. That is so, so hard to do sometimes. I don't know if you struggle with that. Because this flesh that we have is very selfish. And it doesn't want to give that love or that time. Because if you give somebody love, if you give somebody of your time, you're taking away from your own. So it's a, it's a selfish act. So here it's telling us that one of the fruit of the Spirit, the first one, the first part is love. And it says, one of the Bible verses that everybody is familiar with that talks about love is found in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And this is what it says. Love is patient. We've all heard that. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Can you go back to the other one? It's... Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not ir irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. Wow. That is a mouthful right there. We can probably just stop and go home. Because once you, you apply all those uh, uh, principles that are here in your life, nothing else in this world can, can, can take away that, um, that love that you have. 
So in, uh, one of the greatest examples of a sinful man in the Bible that showed this kind of love is Joseph. Joseph had been deeply hurt by many people. And if you haven't read, uh, it's in Genesis 37. If you don't, you're not familiar with the story, we're not going to go over the whole story, but I encourage you to go and read that later because he went through so much. And his brothers tried to kill him, and they sold him into slavery. That right there would be enough to make anyone go into deep bitterness for the rest of their lives. When you have your own family members that have betrayed you and, and you know, disowned you and sold you to slavery, wow. That right there would have been, uh, he would have been justified as, uh, you know, uh, to have bitterness the rest of his life. Then Potter, Pot Potiphar's wife framed him and for doing what was right. Remember that she came up to him and tried to seduce him? And what did he say? No. And she got angry because she was rejected. And what did she do? She said, you know, she said the opposite, that he tried to, um, to um, seduce her. <laughs> yeah. Then we see that, that when he was in prison because of this, the Pharaoh's cupbearer forgot Joseph and everything that he did for him in the prison. Joseph's life could not have been defined, uh, Joseph's life could have been defined by deep sorrow and bitterness over betrayal and neglect. But it wasn't, but it wasn't. Ultimately, Joseph forgave everyone who hurt him. After his rise to power, he showed his true colors. When he was in, in power, that's when you know the person's heart when they are in power, because people become haughty. They become, um, uh, you know, they, they, they think that they're better than anyone else. But here, Joseph was very humble. And what happened? When his brothers came to him, because there was a famine in the land, his, his brothers, it's been 20 years, his brothers didn't even know who he was. They had heard of Joseph, you know, of, of the, the person second in command, but uh, which was uh, the Pharaoh's second in command, was, which, which was Joseph, but they didn't know that that was his brother. And when he came out of love, he says, don't be sad for what you did for me. I am going to provide for you because God wanted this to happen, so today I can provide to you. What a humbling experience. I mean, imagine those brothers when they, they found out that that was Joseph, the one that they had sent, sold to slavery right? Okay, so the Lord says in Mark 12, 30 and 31, that the greatest commandment is love. And it says, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, okay? All your mind, remember mind, will, and emotions, and all your strength, the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater. That is the greatest commandment in the Bible. To love the Lord your God and love others as yourself. And yes, a lot of us love the Lord with all our heart, but it's hard to do the second part. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is hard. Because, again, we have a sinful nature and we want to be, it's, it's about us. <laughs> um, also, in 1 Corinthians 13.1, it says, If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And I want to tell you something. Love in this, in this part of the fruit, without love, there is no other part of the fruit. Love is the most important in part characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit. Because that is what binds everything else together. Because if you don't have love, you can't have joy. 
If you don't have love, you can't have peace. If you don't have love, you can't have patience. If you don't have love, you do not have kindness. If you don't have love, there is no goodness. If you don't have love, there is no faithfulness. If you don't have love, there is no gentleness. And if you don't have love, there is no self-control. So love is the one that binds the fruit together. So let's not forget that. So the second characteristic, the second attribute of the fruit of the Spirit is peace. So the word peace here is shalom in Hebrew. And it came from the Greek word irin, which means when you have peace, it's the opposite of war. It's the condition resulting from a termination of war. So peace, there was a war, and once it's terminated, it's that peace. Haven't you ever been in a spiritual battle or something in your life that maybe they, you, you thought you had breast cancer, you thought you, you know, your, something happened to one of your family members, and you feel like if you can't breathe, it's like a war that's going on in your spirit because you're trying to believe, and at the same time, you're hearing what the... What the what the, um, what the doctor says, and so there's a war. But once you find out that you're fine, it's like an overwhelming peace that just comes over you. That's the peace it's talking about here, that we should always have that peace, that, you, that uh, uh, shalom, which is the peace in Hebrew. Um, so also in the state of law, and in order that, and, and order that yields blessing and prosperity, that's part of the definition. So... Once there is war, there is order, and it yields blessings and prosperity. That's what peace is. It yields blessings and prosperity over our lives. Peace is also linked to safety, happiness, and comfort. Peace is not easily achieved because there's always an internal and and external disturbance in the life of an individual. But as Christians, the word of God says in Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep in perfect peace all those who trust in you, all those whose thoughts are fixed on you. So he's going to give us perfect peace when we do what I said at the beginning, pray, worship, spend time in the word, that's where you get that peace. That's where you get the strength. Tribulation, we know, is unavoidable. There's things that are going to happen in our life that are unavoidable, unavoidable. But we have the choice to live in peace. And that peace is always available to us by God. As believers, we find, we find peace in knowing that Jesus Christ already overcame the world just as it is written in John 16, 33, where it says, I have told you these things so that you may be, may have peace. In this world, you would have trouble. The Lord tells us we're going to have trouble in this world. While we're here living, I don't care if, if you spend 10 hours in the word every day, you are going to have trouble, okay? But there's a promise. But take heart. I have overcome the world. That's what the Lord says. We cannot control the things that happen around us or to us, but we do control how we respond to it. Absolutely. And in John 14, 27, it says, I am leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind, peace of heart, that's your soul. Peace to your heart, peace to your your mind. And the peace I give is a gift, and the world cannot give it. Only God can give you that peace. You know, the world can give you temporary peace, something temporary. Like I said that the soul, the happiness that the soul craves is only temporary because you can be happy one moment and sad the next. But the peace that the Lord gives is eternal, is forever. 
And in Isaiah 26, 3, it says, you will keep in perfect peace all those who trust in you. The Lord is the one that gives us that peace because we trust in him. When we're believers, we trust in the Lord. And all those thoughts are fixed on you. So patience. I know. Yeah, this, <laughs> I'm running out of time here. but <laughs> Patience. I need to have patience. <laughs> Does anyone here like waiting for something? I didn't think so. Oh, you like waiting for something? <laughs> You're waiting for what? She is, yes, but do you like waiting for it? Do you like spending that time that you have to wait to get it? <laughs> I don't. I mean, especially in this world nowadays that we want everything, it's micro, everything is microwavable. You want to put your whatever it is you put your petition in and you want it to be answered right away but no we don't grow that way <laughs> so um patience it says in james 5 7 and 8 be patient then brothers and sisters until the lord's coming see how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop that in it's in it as itself it's going to take like 10 minutes so i'm not going to go there but Think of a farmer. What does he have to do? First, he has to seek the field. He has to um, plow the, the, the ground. He has to prepare that ground. Then he has to put a seed in. Then he has to cover it. Then he has to water it. Then, you know, and some of them will grow and some of them will die. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's just think of that and then think of how patient he has to be in order to be able to see the fruit that is coming out from that ground. So it, this, it's a process. Patience is a process, but we need it. Rush. We cannot push it. We cannot move it forward. It has to be in God's timing when we're in his control and we submit ourselves to him and we lay everything at the throne. There's a process. Some things, sometimes he does things suddenly, but sometimes, you know, you feel that it's taking forever. Sometimes it could take for years. And, you know, when we trust him, it doesn't matter how long we have to wait because if we just lay it all at his throne and we learn to put that trust in him, it, the time is not going to seem as bad as if you're focusing, oh, why hasn't this happened? Or, you know, or making, or you trying to make it happen because when you try to make it happen, it's not, it's going to be the wrong thing. So, uh, in, um, Psalms 37, Seven, it says, "Be still in His presence, of the uh, be still in the presence of the Lord, and wait patiently for Him to act. Wait patiently for Him to act. Don't try to help Him, please, because you're going to ruin it. Whenever you try to help God, you're going to ruin it. He doesn't need our help. We have to wait patiently for Him. Do uh, don't worry about evil people who prosper and or fret." about their wicked schemes. Um, and I'm going to conclude here because if not, we're not going to be able to go to the second part, which I'm excited to hear about. Pastor Sandra is going to uh, bring the second part of this, and then we're going to wrap it up at the end. I am done. Mm -hmm. I skip like no, four pages, so you, you know that. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, this lesson here is This is such an important lesson and actually should have been two two parts. But, you know, I want to start the new year with something that the Spirit uh, of God put in me. So I didn't want to delay it. So we're going to make the best out of it. And I know that you could, you're could you going to receive a lot. I'm going to take a second. Uh, can you put the share screen? Everybody, can you just get your phones, align uh, it to the QR code? It's going to take you to your uh, you, our YouTube page. All you have to do is share it to your social media. Uh, just share it or like it, at least like it and subscribe and click on the little bell so you could get notifications every time we have an event or a teaching going on. It's a good way to A, if you really believe that this is something that other people should be hearing, it'll be a good way to promote it and uh, be in, um, 
you know, be active in that world of uh, social media. Amen? So, you know, what my sister and my twin talked about in Galatians 5, 16, 18 describes something that we all are very aware of. The battle is real. We have an ongoing battle all the time. And what is the battle, you may ask? It's the battle of the spirit and the battle of our sinful nature. The sinful, and that's the only battle that there is in this world. There's no other uh, spirit. The spirit of the evil one and the spirit of God. So we're constantly in a battle, constantly in a battle. But which one is winning your battle? That's something that we need to kind and take inventory. Which battle are you surrendering to? The battle of the sinful nature that comes through the evil one or the battle of the Holy Spirit working in us and giving him the victory. Amen? So that's what the fruit of the Spirit is really going to teach us. Apostle Paul is teaching us. Right? Which one are you surrendering to? And the way I see this teaching is the garden of life. Everybody wants a beautiful life. Uh, think about a, a fruit, right? Where, where does a fruit grow? In a garden. Nobody wants a garden full of weeds. Have you ever gone to somebody's house where the backyard or the front yard is full of weeds? Is it a pretty sight? No. And it's not only not a pretty sight, but it brings uh, rats, it brings cockroaches, it brings, uh, you know, different animals that you don't want to be part of. That's what weed brings. That's our sinful nature brings in, in our body when we operate only in our natural being and not in the spirit. But I'm here to tell you that you cannot grow a beautiful garden without pulling out those weeds first, right? You got to take the time to pull those weeds out. I know when, uh, when I was a single mom, I used, and uh, my daughter's here, Megan, let's give her a round of applause. I'm so, I'm so happy that she's here. But I, I'm sure Mamie remembers me. I used to go to the front of my yard, and I would lay down, I would get on my knees and pull the weeds out. It, it, it was a, it was a I hated that weeds, right? I would and pull the little weeds out because they look so ugly and like. And then all of a sudden, I had a big brown spot because it was a big brown spot of weeds, right? Well, that's what we are. When we start pulling all of our weeds, we have a beautiful soil that now we could do what plant the beauty of this Holy Spirit in us. We need to pull out all the weeds. And she already described what are the weeds, right? What are the spiritual weeds? In uh, Galatians 5.19, right? Sexual immorality. If there would be no sexual immorality today, there would be no human trafficking. There would be no uh, assaults on the little children where they're getting raped every day. That is sexual immorality. If we would apply my, more of that in today's life, we will have a better garden of life for everybody to live on, right? Impurity, lustful pleasures. If we didn't have no lustful pleasures, people would not cheat on each other. You know, be content with the husband or the boyfriend that you have. You're always looking at the other garden, but you didn't look at the weeds behind the garden, right? Be content. Idolatry, sorcery, hostility. And if you're the type of person that you say, well, I'm a Christian, you know, I don't deal with any of that. Wait, wait a minute. I have something that you are dealing with. How about quarreling? How about jealousy? How about outbursts of anger because you don't have no self-control? Paul leaves nothing out. You know, because there are people that say, oh, I am so holy because I've been a Christian for 40, 50, 60, 70 years. I have not. not. No, how about jealousy? How about selfish ambition, drunkenness? And then if none of that you can relate to you in your life, Paul says, and others like this, and others like this, we all struggle with something that is of our sinful nature. All of us do, including myself. But the, the best way to, go, to build a beautiful garden is to see and recognize that you're not okay with that. Just like I saw my front yard and I said, I am not okay with those weeds in my front yard. I, I need to go pull them out. 
You need to recognize that in your life and say, I am not okay with being a quarreler. I'm always fighting with my husband. I'm always fighting with my neighbor. I'm always fighting with my coworker. It's all them. It's their fault. You can never see yourself in the mirror and the mirror say, maybe it's me. Like as Addis, my sister said, you could only control you. You could only change you. And why, by why I, what, what I say change you, I'm not saying that now you're going to become a doormat. I am not a doormat. I'm here to tell you I'm a very feisty little person. <laughs> but I am getting better on how am I going to react when someone offends me, when someone takes me for granted. I cannot control them that they are offending me, but I am going to control my, me and say, you know what? If you take my peace away, it's too expensive. I can't afford it. I cannot afford living without peace. I cannot afford living without joy. And I'm here to tell you that if you go to the battlefield of, of, of the ground of a spiritual battle and you don't have joy, you're already lost. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy means that even though I'm being challenged, I have made up my mind that I am not going to be affected. I am not going to be moved. Your problem is not my problem. Your bad attitude is not my bad attitude. You know, I, I'm going to keep my space. That's the joy. You, but you have to make up your mind that that's what you want. You don't want weeds. You're going to start pulling them out. Amen? So now it says... I have told you before, this is Paul telling us that anyone living that sort of life will not inher inherit the kingdom of God. What life is that? Well, the kingdom of God is in uh, Romans 14, 17, it says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what are you going to wear. That's not the matters of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is living a life of goodness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. If you think that you could battle all of this in your own strength, you're wrong. Only in the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to give you the strength to do so. Only the Holy Spirit is going to give you the wisdom to love the unlovable, the patience to love the unlovable. Only the Holy Spirit is going to give you the strength to walk away from one of your biggest weaknesses, only the Holy Spirit. So if you're thinking here that I got to try harder, it's not about trying harder. I hate when someone tells me I want to try harder. It's not about trying harder. And I'm going to tell you in the next few minutes what it's about. So, you know, if we don't pull the weeds, it will destroy your foundation. It will start making cracks in your walls. And it will destroy your character in the spiritual world. If you don't say, you know what, I don't do this anymore. i got to pull this out of my life. If not, before you know it, you're compromising, and it's destroying your, your godly character. So there's a man that I spoke to one day between me and my husband, and he came up to us, and he said, you know what, Pastor, I'm trying to love my wife better. I want to love her. I, I don't love her. I just fell out of love. You know, we've been married for 17 years, and I just fell out of love. I don't love her anymore. I pray, and I pray that I love her, and I love her, you know? And then what happened? He had a sinful nature that he was dealing with called lust, called pornography. He was watering the weed. He was throwing water on the weed, which is lust and pornography. So the love for his, the, the fruit of the spirit, which is love, your wife, was being choked. Because that's what the weed does. It chokes the living light of us. Stop that pornography. Stop, you know, have self-control. And you're going to see how you're going to be able to see your woman and your, and, your, and your wife with a love again that you once before, once had before. So I'm here to tell you. That is not here on your own power. Let the Holy Spirit help you. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Say, God, Holy Spirit, I need help in this area. Be transparent. Be authentic with yourself. I am falling short in this. I am falling. I'm falling. I'm finding a hard time. Loving someone that constantly accuses me, constantly uh, criticizes me, constantly sees the bad in me, cannot see the good in me. I'm having a little bit of trouble with that person, God. Can you help me love this person? 
Can you help me appreciate this person? Can you at least help me respect this person? If anything I could do is at least respect this person. And the Holy Spirit will jump in for us. I tell you, he will. In Galatians, Apostle Paul is uh, teaching us and revealing to us some attributes, the character of God, which is the fruit of his spirit. That's why we call it the, the fruit of the spirit. It's the attributes of God, the character of his spirit. So Sister Addis talked about that the Holy Spirit produces, which is the result of his presence in us. The result of that we are walking in his presence. It will produce love, joy, peace that she covered. And now my part is kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What a beautiful bouquet of roses and flowers. Isn't that such a beautiful bouquet? That's the garden of life that we want to be producing, right? So now, these nine things are the attitudes. They're describing your attitude. Are you going to have a good attitude? Are you going to have a joyful attitude? Are you going to have an attitude of love, right? Are you going to have an attitude of patience? So uh, if you don't mind showing the picture of the fruit. So without... Uh, You can't love without an act of love. You can't have joy without an expression of joy. You cannot tell me, Sandra, I'm very, oh, I am highly highly blessed and highly favored. I have the joy of the Lord. But siempre te, your your face is always bitter. You're always tense. You're always looking like, you, you, you know, no, you cannot say that you have joy without an expression of joy. Naturally in your face, because that comes to, uh, naturally from the Holy Spirit. So this is some fruits over here. I did a little bit of uh, a research. We need to discover some fruits that we've never discovered before. How many of us have figs in your house? Ladies, if you're, hus- if you're married, buy them for your husband. They're good for the prostate. Figs. Dates. Rhubarb. Did you know that rhubarb is qualified as a fruit? Rhubarb is technically a vegetable, but it was legally considered a fruit in 1947 in New York, declared that rhubarb is a fruit. Why? Because it's mostly used to cook as a, a for desserts, the rhubarb. Okay? So Google it. It's there, right? So this is some fruits that we've never, ever discovered. And one fruit of the spirit that access, uh, we're running out of time, one fruit of the spirit that I'm going to take some time about today to bring to your discovery is gentleness. We all pray for joy. We all pray for love. We all pray for peace. But how many of us pray to be a little bit more gentle? <laughs> I need to be a little bit more gentle. Right? We're going to pray for the fruit of gentleness. Gentleness. And why is it that we don't want to be gentle? Because we feel or we fear that if we're gentle, oh, they're going to be a sign of a weakness. Oh, people are going to take me for granted, right? Oh, I don't want to be too modest. We feel that we're going to be, you know, it's a bad thing. But no, it's actually a very, very beautiful fruit, right? So it's not something that, It's a sign of weakness or it's a person that's too passive or soft or spineless. The dictionary, gentle means mild, docile, soft, and tender. But in the scripture, in the Greek word, gentle, uh, pratus, prateus, and the Latin word is modestia, like modest, modestia, can be translated as meekness and humble heart. Having a humble heart is a, is a sign of gentleness, meekness. The Bible's verse in Matthew 5, 5, it says, blessed are the meek. If you don't mind putting that up. Blessed are the meek, means the humble. For they shall inherit the earth. They will rule the earth, the meek and the humble. Not the proud, not the self-absorbed, not the one that thinks I'm better than everybody else. 
the meek and the humble. So the Greek word patuos, and this is a great story, is used to describe a powerful stallion. How many of you love horses, right? It's a powerful stallion once it's been completely trained so the owner could benefit from its power, right? So the owner could benefit from its power and accomplish its purpose. You could be beautiful and powerful, but if it's out of control... You're not very useful. You're not, benefic- you're not beneficial to others. And life is greater than just yourself. Life, life is about helping, encouraging, saving others. If you are self-absorbed, the thinking is only about you, you're missing the mark. Amen? So think of this beautiful stallion out of control. How can you be useful to you? God has implanted power in all of you. All of you have a special power, special talent, and a special gift. So according to scripture, gentleness is not about weakness, it's about meekness. Learning to control the power that God has placed inside of us for the benefit of others. Because either your power with your words have power, Your words are either destroying or building. Your future or your your, your neighbor's future or your family's future, your friend's future. What are you using the power that God has given you and blessed you with? Is it going to be something very destructive to self-destruct yourself and destruct others? Are you going to use it to build yourself and build others? It's a choice. Amen? Amen? So, God gives us strength, but listen to this, ladies. Satan, we know who Satan is, right? That will not today. Satan will use the same strength that God has given you to hurt and destroy other people. One is the act of the sinful nature, and one is the anatomy, antonomy, antonomy, Predators is to the fit of rage, outburst, antonym, thank you. One is the antonym of predators is a, a fit of rage, outburst, and anger. So it, you're either gentle or you're always constantly with outbursts of anger. Rudeness, right? Which one are you surrendering to? So if you want a life of a beautiful garden which is the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm going to here to tell you that you may have one, two, three, four fruits, fruit of the Spirit, and you're missing the other five. You don't have the fruit of the Spirit. You didn't have all of them or none. You could have eight, and you're missing gentleness. You don't have the fruit of the Spirit because he is a supernatural being. It's one tree, as uh, Addis was explaining, with nine branches, you can't take a branch off because you're still falling short. Amen? So um, the Holy Spirit will help us in the process as we walk step by step with him. The Holy Spirit will help us see people through the eyes of love and compassion. That's one thing. You know, I, I had a very rough life uh, growing up with my mother. And I had to pray, God, give me compassion for my mom. Give me me love or compassion because it was very, she was very unlovable when I was growing up. And that's exactly. And right now I have the one, my best relationship with her today because I see her through compassion. And I decided I don't want to be like my mom. And I fought with every being instead of saying, oh, I am a victim of my mom or I'm a victim of my dad because this is what they, that, this is why they planted on me. I start pulling those roots and those weeds and I say, oh, no, I don't want to be like my mom. But I'm going to respect her and I'm going to love her. And those are, those are the decisions we got to make, right? So uh, there is an occasion here that I want to talk to you about really quickly. In John 8, 4, where Jesus shows gentleness in this event. 
There was a mob of relig religious leaders. How many of you know of them? Re religious people, right? Always looking at the band, always criticizing. I'm more holier than thou. You know, I have no, I, ha I do no wrong. Well, there was a, ma a mob of religious leaders wanting to stone a lady who was caught in the act of adultery. And if you don't know what adultery means, it means that she was having sex with someone that's not her husband. And that's a sin. Now, in John 8, 4, it says, Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses says, stone her to death. Have no compassion for her. She's wicked. She's evil. She's an adulterer. Stone her to death. That's what the Pharisees were saying to Jesus. And Jesus would ignore him. She, hey, master, are you not listening to me? So they kept demanding an answer. So finally he stood up. He wasn't moved. He was very calm. He stood up and said, all right then. That one, all right then, he said, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. How many of you are sinless? that would dare throw the first stone. That's what Jesus said. Come on, throw the first stone. They all walked away, and then Jesus looks at her. Where are the ones that accuse you? No, master, no one. Well, I accuse you neither. I accuse you neither. Go and sin no more. What a beautiful, gentle Jesus. Amen? Go and sin no more. If you don't have accusers, I'm not going to. He could have accused her. He said, I don't accuse you. That's compassion. That's love. So, but if we can, and 1 John 9, and you don't have this. It says, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful. But you got to confess your sin. You got to admit that you are sinful. That you do have a sinful nature. Admit it to Jesus. Admit it to the Holy Spirit. And it says, confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us in our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Oh, I am str struggling with porn. Help me, Lord. I'm struggling with bad attitude and temple. Help me. I admit I do. I am struggling with a, a heart of discontent. I'm never content about anything. I always want more. I'm never satisfied. Admit your sins to Christ. And he will forgive you. Amen? And this should be in every day. Because every day that you open your, up your eyes, every day that you get out of bed, I'm sure you've already thought or committed a couple of sins. Before we even leave the house. Whether we wake up grumpy, uh, you know, I don't want to do, uh, I don't want to go to work, I uh, hate my job. That's a sin. God has blessed you for the time that you, where you are today. So every day, confessing our sin to God. Amen? So that's the seed of gentleness. Now, I want to run through this because I have five minutes. The, the fruit and the other fruit that I really want to concentrate on today is something that everybody needs also. And that is the fruit of self-control. <laughs> the key to allowing the wind of God's spirit to be able to blow in your life it's about making a prearranged decision before the temptation comes. Before you're going to meet a person that's unlovable, you got to check yourself. Make a prearranged decision. You know, I'm going to deal. I, I already know this person. I already know the evilness they carry. And I am going to act this way. You make a prearranged decision. That's the best way that you're going to learn self-control. Before temptation comes. That's in every area of our life, our finances. Hey, I'm going to go to the store, but I have a budget. So even if it's in sale, if it goes out of your budget, you're, you're out of control. <laughs> in your finances, in your relationships. If you're married, make it a prearranged decision to go on date nights with your husband so you don't take each other for granted. 
when we got married, Eddie and I got married, we made a pre pre arranged decision that twice a year we're going to travel. My birthday and our anniversary. Because our anniversary is close to his birthday, so we killed two birds with one stone, same month. <laughs> right? So though we, we already made it. And you know what? When we go there, oh, we're, man, we're so glad we're doing this. We're so glad we took the time to do this. You have to make pre-arranged decisions before the temptation comes. Couples that have a flourishing marriage is because they have made pre-arranged decisions and they are self-disciplined and self-controlled to be able to spend quality time together. Social media, sitting side by side and the phone is not quality time even though you're side by side. Amen? So, you, now, another prearranged decision that you need to have very solidified is your morals. What are your morals? What are your godly morals? I've talked to so many Christian single ladies that date married men. Just only because they're separated. Me, as a single, when I was single and I used to travel all over, all over the U.S., I would sit in a bar to drink my fast meal, and I would get men talking to me. Oh, you know, I'm married, but, you know, I'm so unhappy, and I'm going to get divorced. Excuse me. <laughs> you handle your problem. I don't have that problem. You go handle your problem. You have to be already made up your mind that that's part of your moral, not to date merry men, not to have sex out of wedlock, not to date a man that doesn't carry the fruit of the spirit. Not that he's a Christian. There's so many Christians that are walking backwards. You want to see the fruit in the tree. The fruit in the tree is evidence. I could say, I could see very clear who is praying and who is not praying. It's evident. Amen? So, control your thought life. What you are allowing to take prime rent space in your mind that's stealing your peace. Remember, what you allow in your mind is taking rent space. Right? Is it stealing your peace? You got to evict it. Evict the thought life. Hold the thought captive and say, you're evicted. I don't think about that anymore. I'm not going to sit here and, st and stew how someone misjudged me. No. Control your rent space in your mind. Take every thought cap captive to the obedience of Christ. The key to self-control is to practice advanced decision-making. I'm always late on when I try harder. I want to try harder. No. You're going to train harder. It's not about trying. It's about train training yourself. I'm late. Oh, I'm going to try. No, don't try. Train. Train yourself. Train your day. I'm going to put my alarm. No more than two snoozes. Third snooze is unacceptable. I need to get out of bed and run. you got to train your mind. Oh, I made a commitment. Oh, but you know what? I might be tired at 5 p.m. No, I'm not going to go. Train your mind. Train your day. I made a commitment. No matter how tired I am, I'm not going to tell you I'm going to try. I'm going to train my mind to make a, a, a commitment, and I'm going to keep it because that's part of your honor and that's part of your word. Nobody likes to be dead down over and over and over over the same excuses. Would you like that? I'm sorry. I know my daughter says I got to stop screaming. <laughs> but I get so emotional and so the spirit of God, right? It's not, about, it's not about trying, ladies. It's about training. Training takes effort. Training takes commitment. The personal trainers in here, there's times that you don't want to go to the gym. But you have trained your mind that you're going to make it there because you want to see the results. If you want to see a result of an abundance of life and things to change in your life, you've got to train yourself to acquire the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I mean, not the gift, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's not about trying. It's about training yourself. So we can compare a gift that God gives us and a talent 
to a kite. We have a kite. Uh, Megan, if you don't mind, try to fly the kite. Now, <laughs> now, a kite is beautiful with so much potential to fly high or for the world to see, right? It's beautiful. It's colorful. And it's so wonderful to see it flying high. But the kite needs what? It needs a string. A string of what? So it could be controlled. Because a kite without the control is going to flop. It's not going to rise high and be beautiful. Right? It's going to flop. So this is, the string is your character to control your talents and your gifts. How many, thank you, Megan. How many um, gifted and talented musicians? Elvis, you know, uh, Whitney Houston, beautiful, gifted, talented. They were once Christians. They were raised with a, with a gospel. But they lost control of their character. And they left us way too young, way too early. You have to have that character to control your destiny, your gifts, or else we're going to leave prematurely. Amen? So the only way that we could do this is with the Holy Spirit. This is so important. Why? Because turbulent winds are going to come. Temptations are going to come. Don't think that the enemy doesn't know what your weakness is. He's very aware what your weakness is. And that's the area that you need to build strength in. Amen? So with the Holy Spirit within us, we can be assured that if we stay connected to God and immersed, immer, immer, immersed in his word, the Holy Spirit will impart the fruit of his spirit in us. This is the process of sanctification and spiritual growth. If you're not showing the fruit of the Spirit, you're not growing spiritually. I don't care how long you've been a believer. Kindness. Gen don't forget about kindness, gentleness. So in order, the process of sanctification, it will show less of the list that we, we saw in verses 19 to 21 which is the sinful nature that what we struggle against. And it will show, it will be more evident, the list of 22 to 23 in the book of Galatians. I'm going to finish with this. Galatians 6, 7 through 10 says, Do not be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. Don't think you're going to get away with it when you treat people poorly. You're going to be held accountable. Amen. You will always harvest what you plant. You can't plant a rose garden when you're always, I mean, you can't sow a rose garden when you're always planting lemons, right? So those who, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will, ha will har harvest decay and death from that sinful nature, the death of your joy, the death of your soul, the death of your relationships, so and that, it just doesn't mean your physical death, your, your death of a, ha, uh, of a fruitful soul. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. And this is one of my best and most, uh, I, I love this Bible verse that has got me through so many obstacles. So let's not get tired of doing what's right, of doing what's good. Never. I grew up with that. That, I, that was one of my Bible verses that I would say, I'm not going to get tired of doing what's right, even though it's been done wrong to me. So let's not get tired of doing what's good. At the just time, you will reap a harvest of blessings if you don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do, do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Stop criticizing your brothers and sisters and plant gentleness, goodness. It's all about a long-term reward, not a short-term relief. Sometimes we relieve with short outbursts of anger for the moment, 
But that's not where our goal is, is focusing what are we going to reap in the future, our long-term reward. So contrary to popular belief, building a character is your choice. One of the greatest basketball coaches of all time was a passionate Christ follower by the name of John Wooden. I don't know if you know them. John Wooden. And he said this, talent will get you to the top, but it takes character to keep you there. Amen? So, ladies, today I'm going to close with this. I'm going to challenge you for the year 2022, a New Year resolution. What's the New Year resolutions that we always uh, ask for? More money, a New Year car, what? Lose weight. You got to make up your mind. You got to prepare your meals. If you want to lose weight, that's part of discipline, preparing your meals. Don't leave your uh, refrigerator empty or only with back of cheese or, or, or uh, crackers in your pantry. That, that's where you're going to eat when you get hungry. You got to prepare your meals and you will lose weight. What's another New Year resolution? A better job, a travel, a new husband, <laughs> a new boyfriend, right? What? What's it? I mean, those are the common resolutions that we always make. And this is, this is sad, the last Saturday of the year. I want to help you make a new, improved resol resolution. So uh, make, make more money, get a new job, get a new place, lose weight, get in shape, eat better, find a new boyfriend, change my husband. That, those are the common ones. How about for the 2022, our resolu resolution is to create a beautiful bouquet with all of those nine virtues of the fruit of the Spirit. Start with yourself. Don't think or look at anybody else because we're always trying to correct other people. Oh, she needs to change this or she needs to change that. Start with yourself in 2022. Don't look at anyone else. Jesus said, don't look at the dust in your brother's eye when you have indeed a massive plank in your own eye. So in 2022, make it a resolution to get those nine virtues, that nine characters of a godly woman. Everything else will fall into place. Everything else will fall into place. Because when you walk with the spirit of God, you're walking in your full potential. So start with yourself. And then build a godly character, such as increasing acts of kindness, being more generous, controlling your temper, controlling your tongue, and be a better, have more fruits, fruit of that spirit in 2022 than what you did in 2019. So go home and take an inventory of which of those fruit you need to acquire in 2022, because we need all nine of them. Amen? And you will see your garden of life will flourish like never before. Like never before. All right, ladies, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much. That was, uh, that's a challenge for 2022, and I challenge those broadcast viewers as well to build a godly character. Build that beautiful bouquet of a Holy Spirit character in you, in your life. So it's evident. You don't have to say, I'm a Christian. It will be evident that you are a believer. You don't have to say, oh, I love you, when there's no acts of love. It's evidence. People, want, people are tired of fake news. They want to see evidence. Amen? So now, with all that said, in the next series, uh, the next time that, we, uh, that we're going to meet, is on January the 8th, not the first Saturday is January the 1st, but since it's New Year's, I'm skipping the first, and we're going to start on Saturday, January the 8th, so you're welcome to come back for this powerful teaching of the essence of God. How can we have a better relationship with God if we don't know his character, if we don't know him? 
It's very easy to deny someone that you don't know personally. But when you know them, you get to love them even more. That's why I hate to judge someone that I don't know just by what you tell me. I got to see it for myself. I got to get to know that person myself before I make a judgment, not on what other people tell me. Amen? So let's stand up. And let's, uh, uh, if you don't mind putting that, that on. Uh